Hi everyone, my name is Jeff Mucklin, and this is Science at Home, which is brought to you by the Nurture Nature Center. And it's been a while since we did one of these, and it's about time that we made another. And I mean that literally. This is a video about time. But what is time? How do we measure it? Why is it useful to measure time extremely accurately? These are all questions that we will address in this video. Simply stated, time is the perception that we can act on the world only in the present, and that events have occurred in a past, which we cannot alter, and events will occur in a future, which we can alter. We have standards of time that we use to organize our lives and coordinate our activity with others, but these standards are to varying degrees arbitrary. The fact that there are 60 seconds in a minute and 60 minutes in an hour and 24 hours in a day is arbitrary. We could have used different numbers to divide the time in a day. Our time zones are also arbitrary, and we know that when we pass from one time zone to another, we have not actually traveled forward or backwards in time. The period of time that the sun is up in the sky varies over the course of a year. Uh, we have longer days in the summer than in the winter. Um, the period of time it takes the Earth to orbit the sun is not the same as the period of time it takes for any other planet to orbit the sun. If you're 10 years old here on Earth, that makes you 41 years old on the planet Mercury and less than one year old on the planet Jupiter. Uh, this does not mean that if a person was somehow living in a bunker or a space station of some kind on one of these planets, that they would age any faster or slower than a person on Earth. It's just that if a year is the amount of time it takes a planet to orbit the sun, a person will experience more years on some planets than others in the same amount of actual time. This image uh, here shows us that a day length also varies from planet to planet as well. It takes the Earth 23 hours and 56 minutes to complete one rotation, not 24 hours. Um, but a day on Mars is 24 hours and 36 minutes long, uh, over 40 minutes longer than the Earth. Imagine all the extra stuff you could get done with that extra 40 minutes every day. So how do we measure the passage of time? Well, the movement of the sun, the moon, and stars can be used to give you a sense of how much time is passing. The moon's phases can be used to help you keep track of how many months have gone by. And the appearance of various constellations and uh, the changing of the seasons can also be used to give you a sense of the passage of years. And the movement of the moon, which can be used to, uh, along with the movement of the sun and stars, can be used to give you a sense of the amount of time passing within a single day. These natural rhythms caused ancient humans to establish the concepts that we use today, concepts like days, months, and years. To measure more precisely, we need tools that help us mark the passage of shorter periods accurately. One of the simplest methods was with an ancient Egyptian device called a merket. It consisted of a plumb line and a sighting tool called a bay. Although no, not used in quite the way that I'm showing here, basically the observer would align their bay with the North Star using the plumb line. And over the course of the evening, different stars would cross the plumb line, which would give an indication of what time it was. This can be done with other angle finding tools uh, like a quadrant or as it's been done uh, in Europe for hundreds of years uh, with a tool called a sextant, which is a wonderful tool for measuring the angles between different stars and the horizon. Another more advanced version of this would be a shadow clock. By sticking a, a stick in the ground and allowing it to cast a shadow, it can be used to mark the passage of time. And a more advanced version of this would be a sundial. A sundial has to be calibrated to the location on Earth that it will be used. The angle of this wedge, which is called a gnomon, has to be equal to the latitude on Earth that it will be placed in. It also has to point directly at true north. If done correctly, then it will cast a shadow on sunny days like today onto this clock face 
which can be used uh, to record the passage of time. This clock is divided into the, the hours that we are familiar with. Uh, if we are in daylight savings time, then you would need to add one hour to the time that the, uh, the shadow indicates. And even if set up perfectly, it will actually only show exactly the correct time four days a year. The rest of the year, it will be a little fast or slow, sometimes by as much as 18 minutes. To correct for this, you will need a chart like this, which shows the equation of time. If you know what day of the year it is, then you can figure out exactly how fast or how slow your sundial should be, and then you can figure out exactly what time it really is. This shadow clock is saying that it's about mm, 2.45, and I can tell you that on a day like today, uh, in late November, it's about mm, 15 minutes fast, so it's actually more like 2.30. For a fun at-home activity, you can try to make your own paper sundial. I recommend you set these up indoors because they're just, uh, not going to last too long if they're set up outside, um, but they work pretty well. This one here uh, was actually made uh, for our latitude, uh, about 40 degrees north of the equator. Notice how they look differently, though, uh, depending on what part of the world they're supposed to operate in. This is what a sundial is going to look like if it has to work in Nome, Alaska, uh, which is about 64 degrees north of the equator. Uh, this one here is meant for uh, a location in Florida near Miami. Uh, this one is made to work very close to the equator. Look how low the gnomon is on that one. Uh, this is only 10 degrees north of the equator. And this one here is made to work uh, near Tierra del Fuego, near the southern tip of South America. Notice that it faces in the opposite direction from the rest of them. But yeah, you can go to that website and uh, just plug in, uh, look up and, and plug in your latitude and it will generate a sundial that you can cut out and, uh, and set up like these. Both of these methods rely on being able to see the sky clearly. On cloudy days, they will not work, and they will not work indoors. Uh, other time measuring devices were needed that didn't require you to look at the sky. Really, anything that changes noticeably and consistently can be used as a kind of clock. The earliest clock of this type was the water clock, or the calypsidra. I have a, a working model of one right here. A water clock uses the consistent flow of water, either into or out of a vessel, uh, and the water level in the vessel is checked. Uh, usually the vessel actually has marks uh, etched right into the side of it. Uh, if the water flows consistently, then this can be a great way to keep time. Water flows faster when it's deeper and therefore has higher pressure. Changes in air pressure affect it as well. And uh, temperature changes are the biggest problem. This is because the viscosity of water changes significantly with temperature. When water is hotter, it flows faster. When it is colder, it flows slower. A water clock that was perfectly designed to empty uh, every 24 hours at 70 degrees Fahrenheit will become 15 minutes slower if the water temperature drops by just one degree, 69 degrees Fahrenheit. Candles burn at a fairly consistent rate and have been used as a timekeeper, particularly in Europe and in early America even. As a candle burns, it consumes wax and it gets shorter. A marker placed behind the candle can be used to keep track of these changes. And by pushing nails into the wax, the candle can even be turned into a kind of alarm clock. As the candle burns down, the nails fall out onto a metal tray, making a loud clang. Uh, these candle clocks are not very accurate, though. Changes in air currents uh, around the candle uh, affect how efficiently the flame melts the wax, uh, and changes in ambient air temperature affect it as well. In China, incense were used in the same way. These worked a little bit better than candle clocks for a few reasons. Uh, incense are, are less affected by air currents. They also tend to burn more consistently. And they could be used to make alarm clocks as well by laying a string with a weight across the incense that falls when the incense turns to ash under it or burns through it. I think some of the most creative clocks of this kind were developed in India. Uh, in India, tracks of incense were put in boxes with intricate patterns that burned at different rates, allowing the user to set how long the timer would last. Users could even change the scent of the incense being used along the way so that they could tell what time it was by smell. A huge step forward came in the Middle Ages when people in Europe developed advancements in glass blowing technology that allowed them to manufacture sand timers. 
Uh, sand flows at the same rate no matter how deep it is, unlike with those water clocks. A sealed glass sand timer doesn't experience very large changes in air pressure. And most importantly, uh, flowing sand is not affected by changes in temperature, again, the same way that water was. Uh, this allowed these sand timers to be much more consistent and accurate than water clocks, and they were very easy to use. They still needed to be calibrated, essentially daily, with the sun, and they remained the standard form of timekeeping for centuries. Even more accurate clocks were needed, and they came with the invention of the mechanical clock. Now, all previous clocks used a continuous process, like the flow of water or sand, or the burning of candles or the movement of the stars. But mechanical clocks use an oscillator, and that was the key to improving accuracy. The first mechanical clocks had an oscillating bar called a verge. That's this bar right up here. The verge swings back and forth. This swinging motion is not easily affected by air temperature or small air currents or vibrations, unlike other designs. The most important factor in determining the swing time is the amount of weight on these bars uh, and how far apart the weight is from the center. The very consistent oscillation that we see here is the heart of a mechanical clock and it was gradually improved on. These were also the first clocks that were eventually accurate enough to be used as a navigational aid for ships at sea. You were able to compare the time when stars were rising as you saw them at sea when they would have risen at your home port. And you need a clock to be able to do that. Uh, but if you could do that, you could calculate where you were in the world very accurately. The next innovation was the pendulum clock. A pendulum swings back and forth very regularly with a period that is determined by the length of the rod or in this case string that the pendulum is swinging from. Um, with a short string it's going to swing faster. In this particular case this pendulum goes from this point to this point and back once every three quarters of a second. If you want to make a pendulum that swings once a second it must be exactly 39.1 inches long, uh, and this pendulum is swinging at that rate. It goes from here to here once a second. An even better clock can be found inside every cell phone, and probably in all of your wall clocks and desk clocks and alarm clocks of every shape and style. I'm talking about the quartz clock. Inside a quartz clock, there is a tiny piece of quartz. Uh, that has been cut into the shape of a, a small tuning fork. Just like with a tuning fork like this one, it has a frequency that it vibrates at when struck. Uh, if I hit this tuning fork, it produces a sound as it vibrates 320 times per second. A shorter tuning fork vibrates faster. This tuning fork vibrates 480 times per second and produces a different sound. The tiny quartz tuning fork vibrates 32,768 times a second. The tuning fork needs to be made of quartz because quartz is piezoelectric. A piezoelectrical material bends when exposed to electricity. It is simply hit with a pulse of electricity every now and again to keep it vibrating. So inside a quartz timer, a small quartz crystal is made to vibrate by tapping it with electrical pulses, and as it vibrates, it produces electrical pulses. And it's made to be exactly the right size to produce 32,768 electrical pulses per second. A small circuit inside the timekeeper keeps track of the pulses to keep track of the time. A normal quartz timer will only gain or lose a few minutes per year. Even this is not good enough for some applications. GPS location is determined by comparing extremely accurate time signals being broadcast by satellites. Each GPS satellite has its own atomic clock to keep track of the time. An atomic clock shouldn't gain or lose more than one second every 300 million years. Some science experiments demand even greater precision than this, so it seems that we will one day need even more accurate clocks. But only time will tell. 
Thank you for watching.